afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Russ Eshelman, and on behalf of the Journalism Department of College Communications, I'd like to thank you for all coming today. Uh, we have two distinguished journalists with us today who are going to uh, share some of their thoughts about what journalism is looking like now and presumably what it's going to look like in the future. Uh, they did bring their crystal balls with them, I think, so they'll, they'll, they'll give us uh, something to talk about. That's uh, my agent. <laughs> <laughs> Um, to my immediate right is Russell Gold. Russell was a Wall Street Journal reporter who was actually here for the Penn State Reads program, uh, and he'll be presenting a lecture this evening at 7? 30. I should uh, say that. Okay. 7.30. Okay. Wait, Barry said yes. 7.30. 7.30. Okay, 7.30. 730. All right. Uh, so you may want to come back. He's going to talk really about his specialty at that, at that lecture, which is fracking and uh, the energy industry. Uh, maybe into a little bit about that this afternoon, but, but not as much as you will tonight. Uh, to Russell's right is John Montorio. Uh, John most recently was the executive features editor at the Huffington Post, and prior to that, he was an associate managing editor at the New York Times and the managing editor of the Los Angeles Times. Now, beyond my brief introductions, what I'd like to do to start is just have each of you just sort of talk a little bit about your background when you got into the business and, and sort of what you're doing now. Uh, Russell, why don't you take it away? Um, well, I got into the business in the mid-90s, um, first for a very small paper in New York and then for the Philip Inquirer, back when the Philip Inquirer was going to take over the suburbs um, and hired lots of young people like myself on two-year um, in correspondence, internships basically, paid internships. And at the end of that, um, I was looking around. I was about 24 at the time, and I moved down to Texas because that's where the jobs were at the time. It looked interesting, uh, and I went down there for a two-year, in my mind, a two-year commitment, and I've been there ever since. So uh, working for the San Antonio Express News at first, and then uh, by 2000 was hired on to the Wall Street Journal. Um, and I very distinctly remember I was at first hired on, um, I didn't really have a business background, it wasn't really what I was trained to do, but I found myself drawn to business reporting, frankly, because it just seemed to be where decisions were being made that affected people's lives. So that interested me as a journalist. Um, and so my first week on the job at the Wall Street Journal, we had a meeting of Texas-based reporters talking about what stories everyone was working on, what they were going to do. And I distinctly remember, uh, this is this would have been in September of 2000, one of the other reporters talked about the story he was working on, uh, having to do with the black box accounting, very difficult to understand accounting. Uh, and I, and I, I remember sitting there thinking to myself, I have no idea what this guy's talking about. Um, I literally do not understand word one coming out of his mouth. I'm never going to make it at the, at the Wall Street Journal. Um, as it turned out, that was the story that started the ball rolling with the collapse of Enron, because he was pointing out that their accounting made no sense to anyone, so it worked out. Um, and I stuck around, and I'm still with the Wall Street Journal. I'm actually on a year hiatus, with a sabbatical of sorts at the University of Texas on a fellowship right now, um, but uh, they, they want me back in September of 2016 uh, to continue reporting on oil and gas and renewables and all various forms of energy. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll skip high school and college, and uh, I'll get. To, I'll only mention graduate school because after I left graduate school, I was an English major in graduate school, and you, you take English when you can't do anything else. That's what my parents thought, and I was working construction for a year, and um, uh, friends of mine were telling me that you know you really have to go do something with your education. So I entered a job at Fairchild Publications in the mid '70s, and. Miraculously, they hired me with no experience, and, and I became a reporter for Women's Wear Daily and Home Furnishings Daily, and I did that for a while. And then by another fluke of, of good fortune, um, I, I, uh, somebody called me from the Washington Star, uh, long, long defunct, and uh, because he had a hearing problem, uh, he, uh, he didn't understand that I was saying I had no editing experience. I was building up my, my other credentials, and he, so they flew me down even though it was for the editorship of the Sunday Magazine. I was about 27. And for whatever reason, uh, there, was a, there was a pretty good chemistry between me and the and editor of the paper, Jim Bellows, who was a fantastic editor. And he asked me for 100 story ideas. And uh, he said, you have two days. So I, I went back to New York. I sent him 100 story ideas. 90 of them were no good, but there were enough good that he hired me. I spent five years 
at the Washington Star, and then the Star closed, and I, I was a little fortunate enough to get hired by the New York Times for a few years. I was there for a few years, and, and it was not a, a very happy tenure for me at the time. It was a very frustrating time there. And I ended up very fortunately being offered a job as the magazine editor at Newsday, where I spent five very good years. And then uh, I was asked to come back to the Times and, and uh, to work for the national uh, pages, the national edition, and the, and the national report. And I did that. And I spent the next 16 years there, uh, various jobs, I had maybe six or seven jobs. And then uh, I went, to, I was hired by the Los Angeles Times. By Dean Bacay and John Carroll, and I spent uh, I spent eight years there. I would say six of them were really good. Uh, the last two were a little questionable, and then uh, sometime in uh, February of uh, 2008, I was I was invited to spend more time with my family, uh, so I, uh, I I left the LA Times and ended up uh, not doing much for a few months, and then I then I became sort of a consultant uh, for a while, and then I ran into Ariana Huffington. And we ended up like you know having great conversation, and then she said, you know, I'd like you to work for me in a you know, heavily accented degree, and I, I think I understood her, and then so I moved back to New York with my family, and uh, I was there for four and a half years, and now I'm sort of on a bit of a sabbatical, somewhat like uh, I don't have a book out, but I'm I'm on my own little sabbatical. I have a few months to kind of think about things, and um, I'm now an editor at large for her, and uh, the. the Thinking is that the like like Russell that I'll come back in 2016, but I'm I'm open as as Gatsby said I'm open to all the possibilities of life. So I, I'm not I'm not sure that's what I'm going to do with that. So I'm sorry to bore you, but that was pretty much there are more interesting details there, but I, I don't think I can tell you all of them. So that was that's basically it. Thank you. Let's start talking a little bit about the industry. And one of the things that you guys both know and and, and, and the audience certainly knows is that. People now are getting their news from their phones and from their tablets. So Russell, I'm wondering, in your case in particular, you cover what I would call a heavy, hard news subject. Uh, when you're writing about industry, uh, energy, it doesn't strike me as something that I'm going to read four lines about on that phone. Given that, what does that mean for the future of covering those kinds of subjects? I mean, are people going to be paying attention? Are they going to be interested? I'm delaying, I'm, I'm sort of stuttering here, because that, that's what we've all been struggling with over the last 10 years. I mean, that's sort of the question that we're, we're struggling with. You know, look, I look at my own children, and I'm just dumbfounded by what they get off their phone. Um, and that, that's sort of the first reaction. But at the same time, you know, I also, I'm, I'm sort of a Twitter addict. I love Twitter. Um, I use it. I get my news from it. And, and I think that the challenge for all of us is to find ways to take the serious reporting, the in-depth reporting that we do, um, and to make it, if not into clickbait, but to make it into something that draws you in and that makes you want to click through, makes you want to go visit the page. Because at the end of the day, all we're doing as newspapers, um, in terms of our business plan, is getting people to go to our pages these days. Um, I, I don't even think we're all that, frankly, interested in um, getting people to subscribe anymore. I and mean, that's a legacy product. If you want if you want your news on print, we will gladly sell it to you. We will put in a nice package and, and get it to your door. But I don't think the Wall Street Journal really, that's just not where they're thinking. Um, but so how do you do that? How do you get people to get interested in that 140 um, character tweet to then click through, because once you click through, oh, well then there's this interesting video that they produce to go with it, and then we can sell ads against the video. So, yes, it is always difficult, that is the challenge, but um, I've seen too many people just very serious with themselves, I'm not gonna engage with that. Well, if you don't wanna engage with that, that's fine, but then, you know, this is what we are. We are newspaper reporters, um, and our whole job is to uh, to get people interested in the news, uh, to get them to read, get them excited, to want to come back the next day. I don't think that's really changed um, in many years. So, you know, this is sort of what I do. John, I want you to look at that same question, or a related question from an editor's standpoint. And that is, 
you know, we think of watchdog journalism as the expose about City Hall mm -hmm. and what the legislature's been up to. Um, how do we do that now that we're not writing uh, you know, 10,000 word stories or three part series? How do we do that on, on the phone? That's a, that's a great question. I, I want to start by just citing two quick statistics about digital. Uh, I read recently that um, there's going to be, uh, you know, about multiple mobile phones, there's going to be 1 billion people with cell phones by the end of this year. That's 13% of the world population. And TechCrunch has reported that there are going to be 5 billion mobile devices, different mobile devices connected to the internet by the end of the year. That those are emits. So digital is the future, mobile is the future, I understand what away from it. So to answer your question, you know, it's, it's very interesting. If you don't mind, I have a little bit of a convoluted way to get into that. Bob Schieffer, who's a very, very fine journalist, was asked recently, what is the greatest danger to American journalism? And his answer surprised me at first. Maybe it surprised a lot of people. And he said, it's the loss of local reporting. It's, it's not covering city hall. It's not covering zoning legislation. It's not covering, well, you know, your fire departments, your police departments, your communities. And uh, when I first looked at that, I said, well, there's some, yes? Could you speak up a little, John? Sure. I, yeah, I, 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 sorry. Good. Okay. Um, so it surprised me at first because I thought, maybe there are other big issues that are facing American journalism. Why local reporting? But, and, and why was it suffering? And his point was that unless an entity is developed that takes on the role of what local newspapers used to do, we're going to have scandals of, of an unbelievable degree. Just a great proportion of them. They're going to go unreported, and there, there's going to be just all kinds of malfeasance that we're not reporting. And the reason that that's so important, and I'm going to get to your question, but is because journalism has a moral obligation. And you know, informing the public is, is the essential one. So if we're not able to tell people how to live in a democratic society, uh, it, not only nationally, internationally, but what's more important than having news about your community, then I think we're, we're really in trouble. We're, we're, we're breaking the bond with the reader, and I think that that's why, that's where the money comes in. So I think, like Russell said, it is something we're all struggling with now, and I, I'm afraid that some organizations, not the New York Times, not the Washington Post, and, and I don't believe the Huffington Post either, have given up the ghost on covering you know, important, important civic issues, but I think many papers that can't afford the staffing, that's the first place they'll cut, you know, and, and I think it's very unfortunate. As far as getting it read on digital, I think that is something that everyone is struggling with because you, you have this, this you know, cigarette-sized screen, and so how, how are you going to do that? And uh, I, I don't think anybody's going to have a perfect answer for it, but I do think that serious journalists have spoken about this, are concerned about it, uh, not just Bob Schieffer, but uh, the, the people like Gene Foreman have, have worried about this. And, and I think that if you have the important people concerned and who are running organizations, as the people like Dean McKay is, and Marty Barron, uh, and, and, and Ariana Huffington, I think that we'll figure a way. I, it's, not, it's not a great answer, but I think it's essential. I think it's essential to, to journalism. I don't know, Russell, if you would add to that. Or no, I, I agree that it's essential to journalism. I, I wanted to put a, a little bit of a positive spin on what we're saying. Um, so on Saturday night, I was in San Antonio uh, at uh, a birthday for my mother-in-law, and we were waiting to be seated at a restaurant, Longhorn Steakhouse. And there were a bunch of people waiting to be seated. Every single person was looking down at their phone. So if you think about it, when was the last time, you know, 20 years ago, you would never have been in a situation like that where every single person had their San Antonio Express News or their Dallas Morning News out. We have, we're, we're, we are carrying around um, these devices that yes, they're designed to give you status updates on Facebook, and, and, and but they're also ways to get news to you. Um, and we as humans, we crave content. You look at your phone because there's something interesting going on there. And it's, it's sort of our jobs as journalists to get that news to them um, and to, 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 to get it onto that screen. And, you know, the phones, you know, when I first got, when I got my first phone, which was not long ago, as a professional, it was a flip phone, and then I got a Blackberry. It was five years, I mean, if you sort of look at the phone you had five years ago versus today, these iPhones we have 
can have video on them. They're so beautiful. I mean, they're, they're much higher quality images than anything that's come before. So we had this great opportunity. So, you know, to sort of turn this around, everyone in their pocket has an incredibly um, advanced computer that we can deliver news on in a very attractive way. Um, and if you look at some of the sites out there that I think are doing a fairly good job with this, like a Quartz or something, beautiful, rich images that are coming at you. So that's the optimistic way of looking at it. So, you know, you're not carrying newspapers around anymore. Well, actually, someone in the back was carrying a newspaper around. But we are all carrying around the, these great devices, um, and we're frankly addicted to them, uh, myself included. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean to be, I hope it was a negative. I, I, I agree that there, it's, a, it's a boom in, in technology and that, as I said, the 13% of the world's population will have them. I think my point is that a lot of organizations, when, when they're deciding their priorities, I don't think they're thinking covering City Hall is a top priority anymore. And, and, and that's a problem. And I'm not even sure they're, they're thinking fracking or environment is, is a top priority. And, and isn't that even a, though it is, there's going to be nothing more important. So isn't that really a, a, a function of, of there's no revenue? Advertising has disappeared and, and in print, and digital advertising has not supplanted that. So fewer dollars mean fewer reporters, and then fewer subjects to cover. Where I think the technology and the phone can come in, and, and the huge readership of a place like the Huffington Post, which has 200 million unique visitors a year, is um, the communities. In other words, I, I think that. Um, and I think there, there are lots of data analysis going on everywhere, including at Huffington Post. So I think if you identify communities that are very interested in fracking and the environment, and identify communities who want to know about civic news, and you know, let's say there are only a million people out of the 200 million that want, that's a hell of an audience. That's more than most American newspapers. So I think that that's what we have, you know, putting a, trying to put a positive spin on it. I think that that's where, because I think community and connectivity is another fabric of Future that's tied to, to mobile. That's tied to mobile, and I think so. If you can bring those two things together, I think you can figure it out. I don't know if anybody has yet, but I, I think it's really about community building. And one just quick thing about community building: the last uh, spring, I mean, within the last six months, uh, Obama appointed the first ever White House Chief Digital Officer. His name was Jason Goldman, and he was a creator, among other things, of Twitter, a co-creator of Twitter and Medium. And the aim, according to, to the Obama administration, was because they wanted to create connectivity with the community. They wanted to be active, not passive. They didn't want to just present news. News today is a commodity that we all want to shape. We don't we want to see it. We want to share it. We want to shape it. We want to help influence it. And uh, so that was his goal. And I think, as Crystal Lizza said in the Washington Post not too long after that appeared, it's a pretty perfect definition of where journalism is headed. Uh, it's kind of the social connectivity. And I think that's where, to home in a way of getting back to your question, I think that's what has to be done. There has to be a way that we tap into communities that are interested in these, because there are millions of people. You don't have to tap into all your readers. And I think it's really that niche marketing, you know, to use a business expression, but it, it, and I, I don't know if you agree with that, but it's finding the community that is interested in that material. As well as, hopefully, it's an important enough story, the broader community. I think where I would disagree, one of the things that bothers me about um, the digital news that I get is that often <laughs> it's intended just to speak to the quiet, to the converted. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. I believe this, and so mm -hmm. I'm just going to get all my news that is sort of directed at mm -hmm. me. And I think that's one of the pitfalls of niche marketing, is you can end up just sort of creating a channel to tell people what they want to hear, which makes them feel good, so they come back to, mm -hmm. to that. Um, and you know, but I think for too long in newspapers, especially, mm -hmm. we sort of treated our news like the vegetables. You know, mm -hmm. you need to know what's going on in City Hall. This is good for you, right. etc. Um, but you know, I'm, and I think newspapers have definitely lost a jump on that. Uh, but you know, at the same time, there's there are these new products that are emerging. Um, I can now get I get delivered this weekly called Community Impact to my house. I've never asked for it. It just shows up. Um, and it's it's a tablet-sized newspaper, and it tells me everything that's going on um, in, 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 Austin, in Austin, Texas. It tells me what restaurants are opening. And it, believe it or not, on the front page, it will often have what city council's voting on. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't have investigators. I've never seen them do anything investigative. 
I've never seen them dig into that. Maybe that's the direction they're going, maybe not. But they will tell me what the local, you know, what, what the fight is. You know, there are all sorts of great local fights going on. Every city you get to. Our local fight uh, is that people are buying houses in neighborhoods and converting them to sort of Airbnb hotels, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have bachelor parties showing up in the neighborhood, and the neighbors are all upset, as you can imagine, because they're up in the, of the morning, and they're drunk on the lawn, et cetera. Uh, and they're like, we didn't sign up for this. This is not what this is zoned for, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They will cover that. They'll cover it very well. I mean, the local paper will. Mm -hmm. So you, there, are, there is still a desire um, for this news. I think what, what worries me is, is investigative journalism. Um, although we're starting to see new models. And, you know, honestly, if I were your age, if I were coming out of journalism school uh, or, or a journalism degree right now, um, I would be, at the one time, terrified because the business model is sort of collapsing. But the other, uh, but the other hand, really excited. Because when I went down, when I moved down to San Antonio to take a job, I went down there because it was wide open. Uh, and let me tell you, the journalism world is wide open right now. If you can find uh, a way to do what you want to do, there is no, well, you're just going to have to wait till this person moves on or that person retires, etc. That doesn't exist anymore. The journalism is hungry for answers. Um, and so if you have a new way of doing it, whether it's a nonprofit or um, you know a new exciting way, I think Philadelphia now has sort of a, a local news um, nonprofit, yeah, Billy Pan, which looks exciting, um, you know, there is an incredible hunger for, uh, for, for ways to deliver that news. So, um, you know, that's my way of saying go out and, and throw yourself into it because it is very much, you know, by the time you're 30, you could be running, you know, a news operation if you, if you kind of figure out how to, how to do this. Um, so. Good luck. <laughs> Even on a big site like the Huffington Post, I mean, uh, I, everyone is familiar with the term verticals. It's a, basically, it's a section. And uh, the Huffington Post has the New York vertical. And it covers a lot of local issues. It covers a lot of zoning issues. It's, a, it's not a, of interest to a lot of people because the Huffington Post is considered like the New York Times an international uh, operation. So how do you deal with that? I think, um, you know, some of you probably weren't born when this happened, but back in the early 90s, a great experiment at the Times, which I was proud enough to be part of, was something called the City Section. And the City Section was a fantastic weekly section with some really great people who all went on to very good things. And it was really nitty gritty core reporting. And it lasted for about five years. It was a very, but it, it ran out of steam, it ran out of advertising, it ran out of interest. And that was really too bad. And the whole aim behind it was, because there was a lot of complaints about the New York Times, never covering New York. So this was a weekly section that, did, that covered the Bronx, Brooklyn, Staten Island. We had a team of reporters. We had great editors. Uh, there, there were a bunch of people there. The medical <laughs> editor was involved, Mike Oreskes. And uh, it was a terrific, terrific section. But it died. It died because of, and I'm not saying it, you know, it can't go back. I don't know if the Times right now is doing anything equivalent to that to cover local issues. Because it does see its mandate as broader. It doesn't see unless the local issue has some kind of profound implications to it, I don't think the Times is going necessarily going to do it. There might be a little piece on something, but it's like what Russell said, the, the threat to investi investigative journalism is, is, is more serious. And I think that's what Bob Schieber was talking about. Like how, do we, how do we get these great investigative pieces that used to run years ago? And who has the time and energy and the resources of an organization to do it? And, and that, that is a problem. I mean, not to bore you with this, but many years ago, you predated me, but in the 80s, uh, there was a fantastic series. Well, there, there were two fantastic series uh, about problems in, um, one was called Class 4-4. It was written by Joe Lellyfeld, who, who later became the ed executive editor of the paper. It was an 18-part series using the crumbling educational system in New York City through the eyes of the fourth grade class, which he spent a year with. There was another wonderful piece that was maybe a, a ten-part series. It's called The Block. And it was problems with gentrification in New York. And John Corey, another fantastic reporter at the time, wrote to spend like a year on The Block and wrote about the demise of this block and the good of the block, the bad of the block. 
and how it reflected some national trends that were going on at the time, gentrification. But lots of companies don't have the time or the commitment to do that kind of reporting. You know, it's interesting. If, if you were to, that kind of reporting doesn't exist anymore, except for maybe one place, and that's on HBO as a fictional, <laughs> you know, you'll sort of see that kind of in-depth look coming out of HBO, mostly through David Simon, a former newspaper reporter. But, you know, it's, it's but that's sort of what I mean, that, that there's, yeah. there are these yeah. changes going on, that, yeah. okay, newspapers are giving it up, so someone else is sort of stepping into the void. Um, not exactly the same thing, you know, obviously a fictional version mm -hmm. of, you know, the decline of the American city is not exactly a 10-part series, they're different mm -hmm. standards, but, you know, caught my interest when it was on TV. Mm -hmm. I watched it, a lot of people watched it and talked about it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the one thing that we haven't talked about, which I think is actually really exciting, Yes, investigative reporting is a challenge right now. Um, but on the other hand, the amount of data that's out there. I mean, investigative reporters love data. The amount of data that is out there mm -hmm. and is accessible is unbelievable. Um, I mean, this has just been a change in the last five years, certainly from 10 years ago. I did a story about a year and a half ago now where we basically we wanted to ask a really simple question. How many people live within a mile of a newly drilled oil and gas well. All sorts of questions were coming up about what's the health impact, and we realized we didn't know what the health impact was. But we wanted to know how many people are living close to a well that's been drilled in the last 10 years. And we were able to have a complete, well, we, we weren't able to do a complete country data set. We had 11 states, so the 11 most important states. And we were able to come up with a number because we used map, big data, mapping software, and then we put it all up on the web. And you could click down and zoom to your neighborhood and find where the wells were. And find out, and that's, that's, you know, that is something that's exciting and new and we've never been able to do before. And it was a one-parter, um, and it lived on the web, and it lived on the web. Uh, so, you know, there is, there is a lot of exciting things you can do. Um, and I think, frankly, a lot of them are being driven by data. And not, it, and the other, uh, so I get excited. I'm, I'm kind of an optimist at heart. The other thing you can do that you're never able to do before, is one of the great things about journalism is that you are the eyes and ears of your readers or your viewers. Um, and if you're lucky, you'll get, you'll work for a, a, an organization that has some money and they'll send you some interesting places. But even if you're not lucky, you know, I remember you know, years ago sitting there interviewing county commissioners and thinking, this is really cool. You know, I mean, it, how many people get to go in and talk to the county commissioner and ask them questions and you know, to, you know, to challenge them? Um, not just can you do that now, but you can broadcast it and you can put it up on the web. And there's so, I mean, this, it's so much cheaper to be able to do that uh, with video than it's ever been able, than, than any time in the history um, of television uh, that, that you have in your pocket. Um, the ability to broadcast live in a quality that they would have dreamed about in the 1980s. Uh, NBC, you know, one of the broadcast channels. I mean, that, that is phenomenal. And so, you know, if, if part of being a journalist is that you are there and you get to knock on the doors and you get to go inside and you get to, you know, say to the policeman, well, I'm just going to, you know, I'm a reporter. Why are you here? I'm a reporter. Um, and you get to broadcast it now. I think that's really exciting. And it's something that me, you know, keeps me coming back uh, year after year as a reporter. So. Like you guys are starting asking questions, I'll ask one in the meantime. Um, you mentioned data. What should these guys be studying? What should they know when you get out of here? What skills do you wish you would have had when you got out of school? Programming. Basic programming. Not, not. You don't need to know everything, but to know enough to be able to, to do some basic data scraping. I wish I knew better how to do that. Um, I had to teach myself Microsoft Excel and Microsoft Access, so a basic understanding of that. Uh, to be able to take, um, you know, just basic data manipulation. You don't need to know everything. You don't need to know how to program in Python or whatever it is. But your basic understanding of, of how to take a data set, put it into a program you can use, and then ask it questions, get the questions you want out. Because that's really what it's all. That's what, you know, that's a big part of being a journalist. How many people live near a well? How do I do that? Um, so, you know, that, that would be a big thing. That's what I would recommend. I would add, I think data-driven reporting is absolutely essential. I think anybody who can read a 10K report 
for example, has a leg up on, on a lot of reporters. I think, uh, I think, uh, I think as Russell explained that very well. I would add the, the ability and experience to think visually, uh, which, which ties into the whole multimedia idea. I think we're, we're out there looking to engage people in new and creative ways, and that's where the web is so great because it's enabled this new form of storytelling, as, as, as Russell uh, spoke. And I think our, to me, the equivalent of man landing on the moon was the New York Times snowfall, uh, which ran a few years ago. And it, it was so astounding. It was this incredibly smooth, uh, immersive multimedia package. And that, to me, shows the real power for the first time of what the web has to offer. I think that was an amazing thing. So I think, thinking visually, I think and this goes without saying, I'm sure everyone, most people in this room are digital natives, unlike, I guess, me and we're, we're digital immigrants. We came to the country from some faraway land of print. But uh, people who grew up with that, I think you, you have to know how to do reporting with social media. I think you have to know how to mine that. I think you have to become a social media presence. Uh, in other words, you, today you must brand yourself to stand out. And that involves not only being on social media, but also becoming comfortable with public speaking and appearing on television. And I think that's very important. I think, um, to, uh, along with data, I think small I investigative reporting. How do you find out what the chief of police makes? How do you know who owns a house? I mean, uh, this is very much overlooked, I think. Uh, and it, it's extremely important. And I think it puts reporters at these organizations a step above where they can take this on just the mere, you know, the preliminary story and add some depth to it. So I think that's part of it. I, I'm sorry. Sorry. No, I, I, I want to completely, you, you just hit upon something that, okay. that bothers me. And, um, but I agree with you. Okay. Um, that there's sort of this sense in journalism that if you're an investigative reporter, capital I investigative reporter, you're supposed to go out and do five-part series and there are certain <laughs> subjects. I, I think I, I'm very much of the mind that if you're an investigative reporter, you can be an investigative reporter for a story. You know, a basic 500 word story, like you said, to be able to know how to take that extra step to find out where the police chief lives. Um, perfect example, this great story came out of Texas a couple weeks ago, out of San Antonio, where the city manager was ordering the police to clean up homeless, or not clean up, to get rid of homeless, right outside of her apartment house. Well, how did they figure out where she lived? You know, I mean, so this was, that was a small eye investigative, and it was great, and it got a lot of social media presence. But, and it got at this bigger issue of abuse of power. You know, what did, did it bring down the city manager? No, but let me tell you, I'm sure a lot of people after that story came out are asking themselves, do I really trust the city manager? I mean, if, if she's doing this, what else is she doing? So anyway, thank you for bringing that up, because I, I completely agree with that. Be an investigative reporter all the time in your life, you know, in your job, and don't worry about like, okay, I'm not being a capital I investigative reporter who's gonna go out and win uh, award. That will come later. Just just do it. One other thing I'd add to the reporting is um, shoe leather reporting. I think that's a real lost art form. I think that most people, not, not every person, but my experience at the Huffington Post was that many of the people uh, that work there, the, the younger people, everybody there is young except me and Ariana. Uh, but they were all like uh, the average age 26, 27. They would do most of their reporting behind their computer screens. So I think that uh, it would certainly should be encouraged in journalism school that people get out on the street, actually talk to people, actually go to the events, see what's happening at the fire. Because how do you develop sources? How do you develop knowledge? How do you get color and character in a piece without the details? And you don't get the details on the phone. It's just like too many people are doing these interviews by email. And that gives people chances to fine tune their responses and even maybe have them lawyered. But you know, face to face interview, shoe leather reporting, I, I think that it's very underrated today. And it's, it, it sounds, making me sound like an old timer, and I am, but I think that it's something that I would encourage everyone in journalism school to do a lot more of. There's no better way to improve your, your writing and your stories than experiencing the event or the person face-to-face, uh, -face. and I, I know Russell does that brilliantly, and uh, he doesn't do all of his work behind his, uh, his laptop, uh, so uh, he goes out on the, you know, on the road, he goes out, and that's what you have to do, and it's harder, it's more rigorous, it, it takes a lot of energy, and it's, isn't it easier just to, to do some Googling, and, uh, and it is easier in some ways to do Googling and send a bunch of questions out to people, so I would say that, that would be another 
another thing I would encourage people to. to We're about 35 minutes into this, and the first time I heard the word writing. Right. So my question is, is does that matter anymore? These guys know how to, have to know how to write. Uh, I would say that I, I think everything that we've talked about doesn't count if you can't convey what you've reported clearly in a compelling fashion. And I, I don't think there's any easy road to becoming a better writer. I do think, I would say that, uh, you know, Stephen King has written a wonderful book on writing, and, and his book says very clearly that the, the, there are two keys to it. Number one, uh, great writing is, rewriting is the key to great writing. You, you can't just, because your first draft, basically, you're telling the story to yourself. Your second draft, you're taking out all the stuff that's not the story. And, and, and I think that there's, there's a lot of truth to that. And the other thing he says, and it sounds very simplistic, but it's been repeated by people like William Zinzer and uh, you know, um, uh, Theodore Bernstein, uh, that the only way to really become a great writer is to read other great writers. And, and to write a lot yourself, but to read a lot of great writers. And, and that just brings up one other thing that I think should be taught, and that is historical context for journalism. I think it was surprising to me, if not occasionally shocking, at the Huffington Post, how few people knew anything about the historical context of journalism. The great journalism that was done in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, and everything, that people didn't know who Harold Hayes was, they didn't know who Joe Mitchell was, you know, Clay Felker was, a, I think he was an editor, you know, so there, there who was Arthur Gale. So there were these, I think you need to know, nothing is, nothing is um, created in a vacuum, and I think you've got to know you know, you've got to read the Gates of Leases, uh, Frank Sinatra Had a Cold, to understand how to craft a profile without actually having access to the subject. You know, so, so there's just lots of stuff I think that you can learn. I'm not saying we'll all be Gates of Leases. That's going to be very hard to do. I'm trying to be optimistic. But, but uh, I think that you can learn a lot by reading good writing and, and reading good, good read memoirs and, and uh, by just, just writing a lot, just going out and writing a lot. It sounds so simplistic, but it takes a lot of energy and work to write a lot and to read a lot. Yeah. I mean, you know, if someone says to you, well, what was the last book you read? You should be able to, you know, you should be able to say, I just finished reading this. And if it's not yes, a book, absolutely. it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a great magazine piece I read. Or, mm -hmm. you know, something visual. I just watched this great piece of storytelling on, mm -hmm. um, you know, you need to feed your mind. Um, there is a lot of crap out there, um, and let's face it, we all engage in it, and, and, and you know, I, I, I'll read you know, stuff that I probably shouldn't, but, and that's fine, that's great, I have nothing against that, but you also need to be feeding your mind, you know, it's, it's really true. Uh, if you're not nourishing your mind, if you're not reading really interesting stuff, um, uh, then, then you're not going to be turned around and writing it. That's, and, and also, um, you know, and then with writing, you know, it's just writing is writing. You just have to do it. Mm -hmm. You have to do it, and then you have to do the really painful thing of going back and reading what you wrote. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm and, and you're absolutely right on rewriting, but you know what? Go back and read something you read a year ago. Because it's going to amaze you, one, how much, how bad it was. You thought it was good, but it's bad. How far you've come, and also you'll see things in your writing from a year or two ago that you didn't realize at the time. You'll become a better writer because you begin to understand. You've got that distance now. Mm -hmm. So go back, you know, and if you were mm -hmm. a journalist in high school or, you know, whatever, go back and read something you did a couple of years ago um, because you'll begin to realize, hey, I'm kind of, you know, making progress here. Exactly. I think there, I think that's, I agree with everything you said. I think there are two questions that every writer needs to ask him or herself when they're writing something. The first question is, why am I writing this? So what's, what's the action line? What's the raison d'etre? What brought me to this? Okay, so you've got to be able to answer that. You'd be surprised how many times you start writing, people start writing something and they don't know why they're writing about it and they kind of discover it some way midway into the piece. And after you write it, you ask your second question, did I achieve what I was after? Did I, did I accomplish what I wanted to write about? And those are very difficult questions to answer. So I think that a lot of it comes on the front end. The front end, not only in terms of reading and writing, but the front end and asking yourself the serious questions about what is this story about? If you can't answer that question in a sentence, you don't know what the story is. And I've talked to reporters about this, and they give me a, a dissertation that lasts 30 minutes, 20 minutes, and I said, I have no idea what the story is about. Well, it's about this, and it's about that, and it's about, no, it's about, a story has to be about one thing. One thing is a dramatic centerpiece. 
and then the rest can be supporting material. But you can't you can't be all things to all people, and I think there's just a tendency to just blather because I think what encourages it is the keyboard, is the, the laptop. You know, you can make easily make corrections. You can save, save gets. You can move it around. You can write infinitely. You don't have to worry about typewriter. And I think it just makes people write in a long-winded, unfocused way. And I think that you have to kind of teach yourself discipline by doing that. You have to be real, really scrupulous about your own work. I have some questions from out there. You said that investigative journalism is challenged at the moment. And is there any uh, relationship between that and social media? Because heading 90% of the people in here have Twitter, and we can just stumble upon anything and make a story immediately. So does that take away from the journalist doing the investigative, investigative journalism? I think it's a challenge for a couple reasons. I mean, one is it's basically financial. Uh, it, it is probably the most costly of, the, of, of journalism. You know, if, if I'm going to go out and, and say to my editor, I want to spend two months working on this, and, and by the way, I want to travel, so I'm going to need a little bit of a budget to do that. You know, that's, it's just, it's a challenge. Um, I think the other way social media challenges it is that it, it's very, you know, it used to be when you had one newspaper uh, and on the Sunday, the, the marquee, most prestigious, if they put up your um, article above the fold, Sunday front page, that was the newspaper saying, pay attention to this. This is important. With social media, I've got this stream coming in Twitter. And, you know, depending on how many people I follow, I have 10 different things every minute. How am I supposed to know what's important? So I think it's also a challenge there because, you know, uh, this well-crafted phrase, you know, might get me interested in this story, and I click through and there's nothing there. You know, and, and, you know, how do I know what great piece of revelatory journalism is hiding behind, you know, that, the, that tweet? And I think that's also a challenge. So it's a challenge of getting the resources to do it, but then it's also a challenge of drawing attention to it. Um, <clears throat> Thirty percent of Americans know for a fact that Barack Obama was Kenya, was born in Kenya, and is a Muslim. Would that be still be a Wolver Crumb type worldwide? Thirty percent of Americans know for a fact that he was. What is there a documentation? What? What is there documentation on? Just reading a, in the newspaper, just commenting on the fact of how ignorant most Americans are about what's going on. Question is, how did that happen? Well, I, I think uh, <laughs> it happened for a lot of reasons. I think that uh, you know the web has democratized news positively. It's allowed for creative storytelling. It's it's done a lot of fantastic things. It allows for lots of voices. But I think the rise of Blogger Nation and the proliferation of partisan radio talk show hosts and and, and television talking heads and the, also the proliferation of websites, big and small, some professional and not so professional. Uh, it, it's led to a cacophony of voices, and it's hard to sort through what's a reliable source, what's not a reliable source, and I think that's a really big challenge for, for American journalism. I think, how do you know what's dependable, what's trustworthy anymore? So much rhetoric and propaganda is spread these days as fact. You know, in, opinion is often presented as news in these forums. So I, I can't blame Americans for being confused about all sorts of things. To give you a, another example, during the Sandy Hook shooting, many uh, Facebook, Twitter, Medium, lots of websites posted all sorts of outlandish theories that were taken as very credible. They included that Adam Lanza, the shooter, had died the day before, that it was Adam Lanza's brother that had actually done the shooting, that, that there were multiple shooters, that um, Facebook had already created memorial pages for, for the school prior to the shooting, that the television stations hired actors to be aggrieved you know, parents of the victims. So many organizations, including Huffington Post, I'm very proud to say, did a form of investigative pieces and debunked each of those, those theories. But there was widespread acceptance about you know, there's something more to this uh, Sandy Hook thing than the mainstream media is reporting, because I just read it on this blog post. But where is the source? So you know, I guess you always have to ask yourself, how credible is the source? How can I trust the source? Uh, you know, what validity is there? 
and, and does, does it jive with my own like inner moral compass? Does it seem does it seem like possible that a Kenyan could be elected president of the United States who's not a United States citizen? You know, it doesn't. It sort of defies a, sort of a logic, and it defies logic that there would be memorial websites posted the day before the shooting unless you believed in a, a grand conspiracy theory, which the theory was that the anti-gun establishment thought that this was a, a really great way to, to get sympathy for, for their cause. It's, it's kind of scary, but I, I think that along with, I'm trying to not be so long-winded in my answer, but it, I think the blogger nation, it, it allows freedom of speech, you know, absolutely, I would never suppress it, I'm not trying to censor it, but it also gives every lunatic a megaphone. And sometimes those lunatics have a following. And, and I, I think, I hope that answers it a little bit. Well, when Walter Cronkite went on television and talked about Vietnam, the Vietnam War, and basically said, we're not winning this, that was revelatory. We don't have that voice anymore, right? Because the media landscape is too fractured. So, in answer to your question, no. We don't have a Walter Cronkite. We don't have somebody talking in the media that everyone looks up to. And when he says, you know, the sky's blue, people listen. Right. More questions? Uh, how do you find the human element in big data stories? Um, you know, I, so to go back to the example I gave about the, the how many people live within a mile of well, that was the, the data point that we came to, 15.3 million people, was maybe the fifth or sixth paragraph. Um, above that was the story of someone out in Colorado. Below that was more, another person in Colorado, somebody in um, Mahopany, Mahopany, Pennsylvania. I always forget how to pronounce that. It's a, it's a hard one. No, 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 it's not Mahopany. Um, I think that's it. Uh, so no, it was it was it was actually not difficult in that case. It, but but I can tell you what was difficult is that after spending many days struggling with the data, then you just begun. Now you've got to go out and find these people um, to tell the story that that sort of reflect what your data has found. That's it's just difficult, uh, but it's worthwhile. I mean that's sort of why we did the story. You know we even talked about like do we want to run a companion piece to sort of five voices from, you know, the shale fields and new people, young know, people living there, what their experience has been. Um, it's, it's, it, it's basically just a marriage of new and old journalism. You know, with old journalism is just going out there and finding the people. I actually find it a little easier. Um, and, you know, with, oh, go find someone who lives near a shale well. Who, who do I want to talk to? You know, the last people. But once I have the data, say, okay, these are the people who live near it, then it, it just becomes easier for me. You know, okay, I know the general structure. I want somebody who clicks these three boxes. I'm just going to go find them. Let's offer some more advice to the students out there. Okay. Uh, Russell, why don't you tell us what was the biggest bonehead mistake you made in your career? Oh, I'm going to stop Biggest bonehead mistake. Well, my editors would say anything that has a correction in it um, would be a boneheaded mistake. Um, trying to think of a good example, it probably would have involved not going far enough. Um, thinking I knew a subject um, and writing just based on that and then just realizing, oh, I just didn't, I didn't spend the extra time to really understand it and, uh, you know, watching myself get, you know, my story get laughed by other people. So I think that that's, that's where I'm most critical of myself. So, um, and, and any true bonehead mistakes, I'm just very in the backyard and <laughs> Leave them back there. John, how about the other uh, converse uh, side of that? Which is the smartest thing you did? I would say, this may sound funny in retrospect, but it wasn't. It was very, um, it was an awful experience. I was the editor of the weekend, the weekend editor. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was the editor of the weekend. I was the weekend editor of the New York Times at a, at a certain point in my career. And um, I had gotten this idea to get David Letterman to do a top 10 list for the weekend section, the top 10 least expensive things to do in New York for the weekend. I thought this was nothing short of brilliant. 
And uh, it came in, and he gave me, and he did, they did them, the writers and Letterman, and we were on the phone, and there were 18 of them. I thought they were all hilarious. I, I can't remember all of them now. But. So we picked 10, and we ran it, and we, and the art director and I thought, if we really want to be bold, you know, we were always challenging to reach for fresh and original material at the time. We're going to make this uh, lead the whole top of the weekend section, which we did. And uh, we, we ran this. You know, it was the whole, with David Letterman's face and the top ten was. Um, one, one of the top ten, for example, to show you that that matter of taste that I, I was dealing with at the time was to lay down and chalk out outlines of murder victims around the city. So that was, you know, he's even laughing here. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> there were some worse ones. Okay, so I, we, we did this and came in on Monday. I, I expected to be carried through the newsroom on the shoulders of the, of the masthead. And instead, I saw a meeting forming in Joe Ellivel's office with Max Frankel and the publisher, the real publisher, Arthur, Arthur Sr. And, and Al Siegel, who was the soul of conscience for the New York Times. And he just went like, this to me, because I was outside the culture department, and uh, I figured I'm getting a promotion or a bonus or something. And the public, this is the, this is the real publisher of the New York Times, Arthur Salisbury Jr. We were sitting down. I'm like fully confident, and he says to me, "You have managed to embarrass every constituency at the New York Times." And I would, I was just, uh, you know, and he said there was nothing funny about that top ten list and. I thought it was hilarious. It's not a frame, by the way. <laughs> and there were lots of comments on it from the former masthead of the paper, which I can't repeat. And um, it was just, and, and much to his credit, much to his credit, because I, I really thought that I was going to be fired. Because, you know, you can't, it seemed irresponsible. But Joe Lellyville said that, look, the kid tried something, it didn't work, it's not the end of the world. You know, I'd rather have them try something and fail. You don't learn by your successes, you learn by your failures. I still remember the conversation, and it just sort of quieted everyone in the day, because they were actually forming a lynch mob. You know, it was really, it was kind of like they were going to, I think, lynch, they were going to have torches and everything. And uh, it just quieted everyone down. And um, and then as I left, the little Max Frankel said, just don't ever do that again, kid. So I learned a lesson. I did learn a lesson, because I think that, uh, uh, Again, about taste, propriety, breaking the tradition of the, the times, what's the moral compass. Uh, I think, yes, people do want to read professional original material, but it has, to be the, it has to be an extension of the organization. And the biggest failure, which was not mine, was the original launch of Sunday Styles, which was put together by some of the most creative people that worked at the Times. So I was in another department and when that launch, and it was run by Adam Moss, who was one of America's great editors. And uh, it failed uh, miserably because uh, they were told that they wanted an alter ego of the times, and they gave them an alter ego. But no company wants an alter ego. They want to reflect the culture of the place. And after three or four issues, it became apparent that this was not Timesian. So that that that's but that wasn't my. I think I would have been fired then. That wasn't. My, but it was that it was a David Letterman cover, which uh, I later got David Letterman. So real quickly, I, I thought I thought of I don't know if it's my biggest one at the stake, but it's something I regret. Um, so years ago, I did a three-part series um, on uh, proposed low-level radioactive waste site out in West Texas. Um, lots of impact. The, the state of Texas backed off based on some of the things we found out. Shortly, but before the state of Texas backed off, there had been a big earthquake in Mexico City, and apparently, some of the, you could feel it, some of the tremors all the way up in West Texas. So they sent me out to West Texas, and I'm going around there with an activist, uh, and they're showing me, look, these are, th these are the new cracks in the earth. This is why we can't bury low-level radioactive waste. Years later, having then, you know, I was pretty, you know, I grew up in Philadelphia, you know, new to West Texas. Years later, I realized, no, th those weren't cracks due to the earthquakes. Those are cracks due to the fact that it's just very dry out there, and sometimes you'll have cracks in the ground as it dries out. I, you know, but I recorded this and I just really regret that I didn't have the time or the wherewithal to make a couple more phone calls and say, are this really, is it really possible to have earthquake cracks from Mexico City all the way up in West Texas where you can see them visibly on the ground? It just didn't, it doesn't make sense. And, and you know, it also shows that, you know, you, if, if you're in an area you're not familiar with, take that extra step.
It was just trout. It was just it was just dry ground. It wasn't a good ground. Makes the letterman thing seem like not so bad. I tried. Tried to cover it. <laughs> Thank you, John. If we know uh, Russell's a, an optimist. I wonder if I want to have a pessimist. Oh, yeah. But I'm just wondering. I'm the editor. If, if, he's really a reporter. Yeah, yeah. What is it about? I'm wondering if you're, I'm wondering if you're as optimistic Lots. about the future of journalism as you were when you entered the profession. I thought you'd say when I answered Penn State. No, I'm not. No. Um, am I as optimistic? I think the truth is I am. I, I, I really, even though I'm not showing it, I'm actually very optimistic. I think because there's just so much great stuff going on. And we, and we have the challenges, like Russell said earlier, we, we have this challenge to figure it all out. I mean, we're at a time, I would say it's the equivalent time of creativity that it was in the mid-70s when newspapers were dying. Uh, they, they died then too, and in fact, New York was going bankrupt. And um, the New York Times was actually almost sold to Cy Newhouse. And what happened is they had a, a, a I was told this by, by the founders, I wasn't there then, and that they had this emergency meeting somewhere with Abe Rosenthal and Arthur Gelb and the publisher and all those people, and they created out of this weekend something called the, the, the back of the book sections, which had not existed before. The C-sections did not exist. The Times used to be a two-part newspaper, as most papers were. And then they came up with this idea of a weekend section, a home section, a, a food section, you know, and that doesn't sound so creative now. But that they saved the New York Times. That those sections <coughs> saved the New York Times, and that was a spurt of creativity brought on by crisis. And I think that we're in a kind of a similar crisis, economic crisis. But no one has come up yet with the C sections. No, no one has yet come up with well, this is it, you know. Because when they thought about it, it just seemed so logical to take some of the little coverage they had done and then put it into their own section. So it was kind of genius, because I think genius is really coming up with an idea that everybody thinks is obvious after you say it. There's nothing worse at a meeting than somebody say, I was thinking that. That is the worst thing, and then we don't ever do that. It just, but I, I, I find, yes, I, I'm very optimistic about it, because it's such a creative time. And it's really up to all of your students here, because they're, the, they're and, and Russell young enough, uh, to, to, to solve those problems. I mean that's that's the great that's why we get into the profession now, you know. Hey, where do we that? Yeah, I I'm publishing a newspaper in in, in essence. Um, that's cheap. Six dollars a month is nothing. Um, so you know, go out, learn how to program. Make sure you know how to program. Make sure you know how to put stuff up on the web, and you know, think, you know, realize that you can wake up at two in the morning and start a newspaper and have it up by the time everyone else gets up, because that's really what a website is. And so that's really kind of cool and exciting. You know, and $6 a month isn't that much. Well, thank you both, and would you please join me in thanking them?